Um, let's get started. Okay. Um, let's see, Melissa, were you joining us at all for the when we were doing the video um, introduction to Bible in Color at Old Ed back <laughs> September ish for two weeks? I don't. I think I did once. Josh okay. never here. Yeah, I remember you and Josh uh, joining. Um, yeah, so we were joining with a professor from... Yeah, I definitely did, because I remember the video. Okay, yeah, we yeah. were doing that. Yeah. Um, we're kind of resuming that today. Okay. Uh, resuming those video series. And um, for anybody that doesn't remember, uh, which is likely most of us, I had to refresh myself, um, the basic idea is it's an introduction to the history of the black church in America and kind of why the black church um, kind of looks a little bit different than uh, white evangelical Christianity and some of its characteristics. The last time we met a month ago, month and a half ago, I guess it was November, he started going through a couple different passages explaining how um, kind of traditional black interpretation of those passages, just to give us some ideas of how it looks a little different and perhaps things that we might miss um, in kind of our mainline white Christianity, um, just because we're not used to looking for certain things in the text, perhaps. Um, perhaps pointing out some blind spots to us. So we're going to continue in that stream today, uh, picking off in the middle of a lecture where we left off, uh, as he goes into talking about a new passage and kind of presenting tr a tr one traditional black um, understanding of this text and what it teaches us and what it says about us and the world. So um, this is kind of an experiment. Let me know if the volume is like way too loud or way too quiet or something and we'll figure something out. But I think I know how to do it. Present now. Paul. Paul. Grace, to, Grace you, to you and peace, and from, and God peace from God our Father, Father and the Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ, Christ, who gave who himself for our sins, our sins to, rescue to rescue us from the present, from the present evil, evil age. age. For to the Lord God, God, God our Father, glory forever, 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 forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So, so you can find, you can find throughout, throughout the Bible, the Bible. I want to say, say, for those of you who like to go verse hunting, verse hunting, you can look you can in Galatians, Galatians 2.20. 20. Actually, can I give Actually, you that? Give me that? Free. Can I give you some free stuff? Free stuff? That's why we never thought we were going to go. All right. This, 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 this gives you some great part of theology. theology. This, is, this is free. Oh, free. Like, no one has to do this. You need to sign up for this. There's three places in Paul where we talked about. Well, actually, it's across Paul. But this idea of death for our sins, or he gave himself for us. Let me put this verse back up. Oh, where is it? This verse. This section here, he gave himself for us. So this idea, paradidomy, it's, it's used all over the New Testament. So he was, oftentimes it's like he was given over for our transgressions and raised for our justification. He died for ourselves. It's the same way it's actually used for the Eucharist. He was, this is the body that was broken and given to you. Like this, this given, right? That word, that phrase comes from Isaiah 53 with a suffering servant who gives himself for the people. So the idea of the giving over of the servant for the sins of the nation comes into Christianity. God gives himself, or Jesus gives himself, for our sins. There are three places where this occurs that I want to highlight. One of them is Romans 4.25, where he gives himself, this is the common one, for our justification. So Christ's death is for our justification, right? The second one, so you have justification by faith, traditional Protestant theology. The second one is Galatians 2.20. This is where Paul does the stuff that we say that he shouldn't do. He said that Christ loved me and he gave himself for me. Paradidomy. He gave himself for me. This is Paul personalizing the atonement. This is, people say you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. Paul disagrees. Galatians 2.20. Jesus Christ loves me. Paul said me 
and gave himself for me. This is Paul's personal appropriation of the cross of Christ. But here, Christ gives himself for our sins. And you would think that in the second half, that he would go so that we might be forgiven, right? But what he says is to rescue us from the present evil age. What does that mean? The present evil age means all of the elements of this world that keeps us trapped under sin. Anglicans who are here, when you have people who are baptized, you tell them they reject three things. What are they? Anyone know? The world, the flesh, and the devil. Right? So there's both the society that causes us to sin, the world, there's our own humanity that causes us to sin, and there's spiritual powers. So when Paul says he rescues us from the present evil age, he's talking about the world and all the ways in which the world conditions us to oppose the living God. So the question then becomes, what's included in that world, which is both in our baptismal liturgy and in Paul's theology? What's included in that? The question is, that, does that include the economic and political structures of society that cause us in various ways to compromise our, our deepest held values. We have this in our baptismal liturgy. Right? The world's energy leads us to sin. We understand very easily like this idea, and I said it a thousand times, systemic materialism. The way how our society is structured in such a way to condition us to want and feel like we can't exist unless we have this thing. There's also the, the systemic dehumanization of women across all forms of advertising. That the female body and form is used to sell and for exploitation. Drink this beer and these three women will love you. I saw once this thing in the, like a, like a PowerPoint of all the movies that had advertisements of the, like a portion of the female body that didn't have her face. Right? So we understand that there's something not just individually broken about this, but structurally broken. <clears throat> so the question is, did Paul see this? And he talks about the present evil age. Does that also include the ways in which governments and politicians influence us to be disobedient to the living God? So what I want to say is the present evil age is a social, political, and theological assessment, which we all actually agree with. We believe that the present evil age often encompasses everything except for racism. The analogy that I use, and, it's, and I hate, I don't like to use provocative analogies, believe it or not, because I think that people are easily like, there's a lot of emotion attached to these things. But I use the image of pornography. Not to use the image of pornography, that's bad. I mean, like, we're not going to use that in this class. So we would say that, like, you know what, on one hand, it would be great to change the hearts of individual pornographers and have them stop making pornography. But until such time as that happens, we're going to pass laws and put in practices to limit the exploitation and the damage that it does to other people. We're going to limit children's access to it. Right? We're going to regulate it until we change the hearts. Because we think that there's a system in place that is fundamentally broken. That it's a societal, structural sin rooted in greed and lust and, and, and deconstruction. And we say, as Christians, we oppose that entire thing, not just in person to person, but as a larger phenomenon, as a manifestation of the evil age. But we put race in a different category where we say it's just a person to person problem. I don't understand it. We are allowed, I think, to speak plainly about evil. This is what Paul does. OK, so you can't see this. Just real quick, uh, before we continue on, any questions, comments, agree, disagree, push back, whatever you want, um, what do you think? Unfortunately, I think he's right. Um, people don't see race racism is something that is an endemic evil in the society. Yeah, 
Yeah, I agree, I Richard. Also, Don, we're glad you're joining us. We didn't say hello to you, but we're glad you're here. Sorry, go ahead, Melissa. I interrupted you. Um, I forgot what I was going to say, actually. <laughs> Yeah, I think I agree too. Um, well, but I, I think I don't. I don't know if this was it or not. But his, you know, his comment about you, you have to change the individual more than the, but in the, you know, than the industry and the example of pornography. Which, and I agree with that. You know, you. I think it's it's easier to make change one person at a time or maybe it doesn't seem so insurmountable yeah and then one you know kind of like the spread of the you know of covid you know one person spreads it to some more people and i think change spreads that way as well Rather, you know, rather than change a whole group, like we're going to convince the Ku Klux Klan that racism isn't a good thing, if you can convince one member, for example. Yeah, yeah, it's almost like changing one person at a time is the most lasting change. Yeah, kind of. But until that happens, you need to have some sort of, you know, say COVID. If there were no government regulations or guidance. And requirements then changing one person at a time would be a lot harder we could go in a, to a really bad place really quickly or right yeah well let's continue on um this is the book of Revelation, we're on the Paul, we're on the John. Mourn over her because no one buys her cargoes anymore, cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones, pearls, fine lemon, purple, silk, and scarlet cloth, every sort of citron wood, and articles of every kind made of ivory, costly wood, all of this other stuff. And cargo and human beings sold as slaves. So this is the, the criticism of Rome as Babylon for its economic activity that resorted in this luxurious trade that even resulted in the dehumanization of other people that allowed the slave trade. And this is part of the reason why God, God judges Babylon, also Rome. So Rome as a slave trading, exploitative nation, and this is the important part, is a manifestation of a biblical type. You see? So Babylon, the exploitative nation, is a type of way of being in the world that repeats itself in different epochs of history. So if there could be one Babylon nation exploits the people through exploitative trade, there could be a second Babylon. So what, what, what John is saying is that there's a way of being in the world on behalf of nations that are fundamentally evil. If we had time, we would go back and look at, you know when Nebuchadnezzar goes crazy, you know that one? And we always, we, and this, and you, you, have you all preached on this text? Why is Nebuchadnezzar like driven crazy? What have you heard? Why does God like make him eat straw like an ox? It's okay, it's not a trick question. Yeah, no, it's boring and insulting. Yeah, he did. Turn to um, Daniel chapter 4. It is true that he is judged for his pride. Let's just see. Let's just look in the Bible. Isn't it, isn't it amazing? Sometimes we just look in the Bible and we can find all kinds of interesting stuff. <laughs> like, you know, this thing that we read, this kind of like hiding. I call it, I call them facts hiding in plain sight. Okay. This is Nebuchadnezzar gets all himself in trouble. Um, let's go down to verse 27. This is the whole prophecy. You're about to go crazy. Okay, we're skipping past all of that. We're going to assume that you know it. Therefore, O king, this is the counsel that Daniel gives to 
Nebuchadnezzar, I've never heard this preached in a church. This part. Let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness. And look at this next part. Your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed. Is that what your your Bible say that? Right? That perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. So, yes, was Nebuchadnezzar prideful? Yes, he was. But his pridefulness manifested itself in saying, I can treat the poor how I want and there will be no consequences. Because I am the king who's unmovable. And God says to him, if you don't stop doing that stuff, including the exploitation of the poor. Look at this. This is a pagan king now. Listen to this. This is a pagan king who was judged by God for exploiting the poor. What is he? Where, 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 he's in charge of who? Babylon. So when John says Babylon is judged by God, Rome asks Babylon, he's saying there's a way of being in the world in which foreign nations oppress people through exploitation that brings about God's judgment. That is seen not just in this passage, but literally right there in Daniel. And when I talk about how African-American biblical interpretation, we're not, just, we're not creating new verses. It's because we're asking the question, what does the Bible have to say about the oppressed that we see? And then the text jumps out to us. We say, hey, why is what this part of Daniel preached? So it's not about creating new doctrines. It's about how social location causes different texts to light up. Okay, back to Jesus. This is the beatitude. We might as well stop for more questions, comments, reactions. Have you ever seen seen that in the text of Nebuchadnezzar before or anything else you want to say? So when are you going to preach on it? <laughs> I haven't checked the lectionary. <laughs> and then it all depends if Ron will let me, right? How hard I have to twist his arm. It sounds to me like it would be one of those passages that he'd say, sure, take it. <laughs> exactly. Happy for you to do that. Yes. Yeah, I, I always just, every time he goes through a passage, I think it's interesting, like, the things that he sees that don't, I've never seen pointed out before, but are clearly, like, part of the text, and it's challenging, yeah. Well, we shall continue on. Also, if you ever have any questions or comments in the middle, just start talking and we'll pause it and have a discussion. <laughs> I'm not the only one who can say, let's pause it here, so. All right, we're just gonna do three of them. Blessed are those who grieve, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be filled. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. We only have time to do this for a little bit. Blessed are those who grieve. We can go into an entire exegetical discussion, but I was going to talk to you about it. To grieve, if I'm understanding Jesus correctly, means to actually continue to care. This is what I mean. There's a way of like seeing the sinfulness and the brokenness of the world and kind of getting callous to it, right? You know, you've seen like the world is kind of going where the world's going to go, and all that I can do is protect my family and kind of get myself through this, this, um, this experience with as little pain happening to me as possible. So we see things on television, and we see what's happening in our communities, and we develop something of a hard heart. When I think that when he talks about those who grieved, it's the people who still saw Israel's sinfulness and were able to still be heartbroken about it. So a Christian theology of public witness then I think it begins with the ability to still grieve the brokenness of the world. And there's a way of seeing sinfulness as a manifestation of God's, like, that shows you that God's going to judge them. 
one of the ways this plays out is the public um, adjudication of the morality of every black person who's killed by the police. And the first thing they do is say, let's look at his CV, his life CV. And if we can establish that this person does, did something bad in their life, therefore what happens to them is justified. But you ask, like, that's like such a weak Christian theology of persons? This is precisely the people who are broken who deserve the most dignity and respect. Because they're the ones whom we want to keep alive long enough so that God's saving work can do its, its activity upon us, right? The people who die who are completely innocent, we know they've entered the kingdom of God. So we should be more outraged when we see someone whose lives have brokenness who themselves didn't experience injustice. But because we've ceased to grieve the actual brokenness in society, we see human brokenness as a sign that they just get what they deserve. Those people, the otherizing of people, to allow us not to be emotionally engaged in the brokenness of the world. And I think that when Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, I think he's talking about the people who still see sinfulness or the brokenness of society as a bad thing. I think this is the antithesis of that, a blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness and justice where they will be filled. There's one thing to have like sadness over the brokenness of the world. There's another one to be able to still have a vision for what God wants to do in the world despite the brokenness you see. You see the difference? So to hunger and thirst for righteousness is to, is to keep before yourself the vision of God's kingdom when all the evidence says the contrary. Just like two opposite errors. One is you stop mourning, right? And you say these people just deserve judgment. The other one is you mourn so much that you kind of lose hope for God's kingdom to actually come. And, and, and Jesus says, no, no, no. Like the people who are part of my kingdom both lament the brokenness of the world and they also look for God's coming kingdom. The last one as it relates to Jesus and the public witness of the church is this idea Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children or the sons of God. And I've always thought that this one is probably, once again, one of the more underinterpreted verses in the Bible as it relates to the public witness of the church. Because he did not tell the, the person here to make the people at enmity like Christians. Right? He didn't say make peace by converting them. He actually just said make peace. So what he's saying is that like Christians see people who are at enmity with one another, hostility, and, and the people who follow Jesus step into that situation and bring about peace. Now, here's the question. So some people have said, well, this is simply interpersonal peace, not structural peace. So this is like individuals, not societies. But you have to understand that this, you have to understand this in the context of of who Jesus is. This is the Sermon on the Mount. He's standing on the mountain. Jesus is Israel's Messiah. Then you got to go to passages like Isaiah. They will call him the Prince of Peace. The, loaf, the wolf and the lamb and the lion, they're going to do what they're going to lay down together. So part of the Messianic kingdom was the establishment of peace between peoples and creation. So the peacemaking that I think that Jesus articulates as the king is not simply interpersonal. It is like this cosmic peace. So, so then peacemaking, if I understand this correctly, is pre-evangelistic in the sense of it raises the question of what kind of people are coming into these situations speaking a word of peace? And the answer to that question is people of the Messiah. So our work of being agents of peace in the midst of a divided world is itself a testimony to the kind of king we represent. But if peacemaking is going to be biblical and Christian, it can't be separated from truth telling. Because peacemaking isn't simply finding the middle between two extremes and say, you're wrong about this and you're wrong about this, let's meet in the middle. Peacemaking, if it's rooted in God's truth, has to be an actual adjudication of what happened. And when there's an adjudication of what ha happens, sometimes one group is more guilty than the other group. I have four children. And they often come to me because I am like <laughs> the adjudicator. <laughs> either me or my wife depending on who's home and they come to me and they're like he hit me and that's her version and I'm like why did you hit her well she like stole my candy ate it and then kicked me in the shin and ran away I said okay then, did, he, did you do those things to your brother 
Well, I did. Well, then that means that the kicking has a wider context. So you're punished for this. You know, you get these punishments. You're like mostly innocent, but you still you see them. So then I have, to, I have to make an analysis. So if we're going to be peacemakers as Christians in the public square, we have to be committed to the truth. If we're going to be committed to the truth in the United States, we have to actually get to the truth about what has happened to black and brown people in this country and what continues to happen. So the call to peacemaking is a call to the messy world of political adjudication. You can't do it other than you ask the question, what I'm saying. If there is enmity right now, and African Americans are being or protesting police violence, you must answer this question. Are black people in America mistreated by the police? You have to answer the question before you can step in and say, let's be reconciled. Because you have to speak reconciliation from a place of truth. The point of all of this is to show you that if you actually look at the biblical text themselves, we've created this hermeneutical like prison in which Romans 13 and 1 Timothy 2 are the basis for our political theologies. And if I said you just like take a step back and you and you like you zoom out and you look at places like and this is just like almost ad hoc, right? From the Gospels to Paul to the Book of Revelation, right? To the entire like that carries with it the Old Testament witness, you have more than what you would need to begin to articulate a Christian public witness. And our inability to do so is not because we are unbiblical. I mean, not because there's no biblical warrant. <clears throat> it is not because the only path towards that is through Marxism. It is because we have not, the majority culture in the United States quickly acquired political power and they exegeted from that power. And the purpose of, like, the impact of the exegesis was to articulate a theology of maintaining the status quo. And it was precisely because you had oppressed peoples who came to these texts and began to ask themselves, what do these texts have to say about the things that we're experiencing? Are they able to highlight neglected pieces of the Christian witness? I mean, final questions, comments? Et cetera, et cetera. Um. Now, I, so what was, I don't know if I wasn't paying attention when he said, you know, you have to ask the broader question of are African Americans mistreated by the police? It's like what, so before you can be a peacemaker, I'm not sure what, I kind of got lost in what the point of that was as far as how we can be peacemakers. You, I don't even know if I'm asking a clear question. I, I like think what I does the broader question have to do with the individual? You know what I mean? Yeah, I think I hear you. I kind of Ricky. thought he would answer that, and then he, <laughs> he didn't and then he say anything. Stopped. I thought, okay, <laughs> what? Like, what did I miss? Yeah. Unless that's next week's. <laughs> it's education. not, Richard. Do you have any thoughts on that or <laughs> wisdom? Well, Mosey, you are asking a very clear question about a very unclear topic. Um. Yeah, it's, you can't come right in and say, like, okay, well, for example, uh, with his children, the his example he gave, a very good concrete example. He could have handled it by saying, kiss and make up, shake hands or make up, and move on from there. And it wouldn't have addressed the underlying question of, well, 
why did he hit his sister? Mm -hmm. And he hit his sister because she ate all of his candy and kicked him in the shins. Um, you can't say to... Um, <coughs> people respect police authority if your experience of police authority is that they come in and kick you in the shins and eat all your candy. Um, so to be peacemakers, we have to address the issue of why is there strife to begin with? Okay. And adjudicate who's right and who's wrong. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's also a difficult thing to do. Yeah. It's incredibly difficult. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, how do we do that as, you know, individuals, you know, somewhat removed from power and from influence and or, I think too. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. No, I didn't have much else to say. Well, I think you know, thinking of it as a parent, you know, it's really <clears throat> you have to. You also have to be aware of whether or not you're favoring one child over the other. You know, you have to be cognizant of that too. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that. It's the underlying. Are you favoring one party over another party? For whatever reason, yeah. you know, because there's a, a internal bias or a something, you know, that, that maybe a person isn't even aware of, and that that has to you have to try to be cognizant of that and factor that into your judgment rendering. Yeah, it's a lot sure easier. We've, we've all heard. Too. We've all said you like him better than me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think what I find difficult about it, uh, which Melissa, you already kind of alluded to, is that he, a lot of his points were that we as the church need to be willing to call out a system or a structure and it's not just individual to individual um but his analogies then about how we do that were individual whereas the parent you do have the authority to adjudicate and so how do we as individuals within the church act and speak out as the church on a systems level when we see evidence of the evil age that he was talking about. And I don't quite know how to make that transition and put it into practice no. um, as individuals with the making up the church. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> no. So, you know, within the church, you have individuals that maybe, you know, certainly approach things differently or from a different background. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, which I guess is why you circle back to what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that should be everybody's goal is to yeah. mm -hmm. kind of and get rid of our own cultural blinders and yeah. Yeah, that's the kind of the purpose of this series is because we're all looking at the Bible and we look at it from our own perspectives. Yeah. I'm um, not saying that we're wrong. Uh, when I look at, when I read the Bible in the morning, I tend to see God's love more than the points that he was raising or other points just because it's the perspective that i'm coming from and i'm looking for it yeah, yeah that's a good point it is. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and i think at some level he was you know he's at a seminary he's te you know this class is primarily <laughs> for pastors and it goes 
a whole lot deeper into the weeds in weeks that I haven't watched myself. But um, yeah, I think there's some level of responsibility of like church leaders to you know, be looking for these things that we would otherwise miss from our cultural blind spots or our personal blind spots and bringing those to attention. But then that still has the hard question of even if, say, we do that as pastors in the Anglican church, what's the end point? How do the people in the pews go and live that out? And how do we as the big church or an individual, St. Thomas even, live that out? And I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's an introduction to me as well. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, any, I'm go, I'm gonna probably end this a couple minutes early because Ron's not here and I'm running the show alone, <laughs> and <laughs> got to make sure all the other ducks are in a row. Um, any final comments, questions? No. One, one final thing. Um, yeah. I'm reminded of when Jesus asked Peter three times, "Do you love me?" And Peter said, yes, yes, yes. After that, Peter looked and saw the disciple that Jesus loved and said, what about him? And Jesus said, well, that's not for you to worry about. If I want him to live forever, what is that to you? You feed my sheep. And that's one of the things that, yeah, you, you'll preach about the what we're supposed to do. <clears throat> And we'll carry it out, and we will do our best with it. You have fulfilled your purpose or your obligation in preaching it. Mm -hmm. It's if you don't preach it that you run into problems. Yeah. Thank you. That's yeah, good that's work. a good point. Yeah. yeah. Manny says hi. <laughs> hi, Manny. Hi, Manny. Oh, <laughs> Yeah. Um, and I think next week, uh, what we're going to be, the lesson that he'll be teaching is kind of an overview of the individual black, the major black denominations in America. And so um, I know a couple of weeks ago, Catherine and I were reading something <laughs> and it was like, AME. And well, who's the AME? And I'm like, I think it's African Meth American Methodist Episcopal Church or something, but like that's about all I know about it. So he'll kind of introduce us to kind of some of the bigger categories and um, individual church labels next week. So that's good. Yeah, because I was wondering about that too. Because there's a, there are a couple different acronyms, aren't there, that are similar? Like there's AME, and then they, I think isn't there another one that's similar to that, but yet it's not the same? And, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'd... Exactly. Yeah. So uh, I think there's seven major ones and he'll kind of cover those buckets for us next week so okay yeah look forward to seeing 2021 <laughs> no kidding <laughs> things are looking up right yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay well um i'd say i'd see you at church but we'll, you we'll see we'll you see we'll see you you won't see us <laughs> yeah. hey have a good day thank, thank you, you. Th same to both of you bye everybody bye everybody bye.